Good morning. How is everybody? Good. I, I know that I open the same time every time, but that's what's in my heart. So how is everybody? Everybody's doing good? How many fathers do we have in the house? Would you guys stand? Just want to acknowledge you. And what I mean by that is... No, we're not clapping yet. Uh, so we got fathers, um, any uncles that have poured into to somebody's life, or spiritual fathers, or um, adoptive foster stepfathers. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for what you do, because you set the tone for your house, you set the tone for our church, you set the tone for our community. Um, and I appreciate men who pursue God. So thank you for what you do. We're going to pray for you at the end, but I wanted to acknowledge you. It is a special day, and you know what? Fathers always get the, the bad gifts. You know, we get the terrible ties and stuff like that. So I'm going to acknowledge you, but I'm not giving you anything, so sit down. <laughs> so <laughs> we, uh, we've been talking about culture a little bit, the culture of we, creating a, a church that's about we. And there were four different parts of that. We've covered two of those. Uh, and for me, it goes God, us, them, and you. And so we've covered God, we've covered us, koinonia, um, really spending time together, biblical community. And this week, we're going to talk about them. And I, I, I know I'm almost going into transaction mode. I want to get business done, but I just want to say this one thing. If you don't understand who God is, you're going to struggle in your Christianity. When, when Jesus spoke about the Father, he presented this new paradigm, this new idea of what God was like. And he, he called him Abba, and that is what uh, uh, a child in that culture, that was the words that, you know, it's like Dada. It was Abba. And he was presenting this new idea, this God had always been somebody distant, somebody way out there, and Jesus was, was presenting God as a person that you could come up to, crawl into his lap, draw near to, and that was a foreign concept. And I'm just encouraging you guys today, on Father's Day, know that God is approachable through Christ, that he is a good father, he is loving, he is kind, and the only way that we actually impact our community or our families is that we begin to understand that, and that's revealed. And so I'm just praying for you guys today. I'm praying for you this week that you would have this greater revelation of God's love toward us. So this week we're talking about them and learning how to see other people. So if you'd stand, we're going to read scripture this morning. 2 Corinthians 5, 11 through 21. It says, because we understand our fearful responsibility to the Lord, we work hard to persuade others. God knows we are sincere, and I hope you know this too. Are we commending ourselves to you again? No, we are giving you a reason to be proud of us, so you can answer those who brag about having a spectacular ministry rather than having a sincere heart. If it seems we are crazy, it is to bring glory to God. And if we are in our right minds, it is, to be, it is for your benefit. Either way, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human, stand, sorry, a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view, how differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, and a new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God, who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak to Christ when we plead. We, we speak for Christ when we plead. Come back to God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Let's pray. God, teach us. 
Teach us about this new life. Teach us, God, that we are your ambassadors. And what we know about you is what we're able to give away. God, teach us to treat them and to love them and to give to them and to be ambassadors to them on your behalf. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So the gospel is other-centric. We receive this incredible opportunity. We, we, in, we receive this incredible new life, but really it's to give it away. So I have a definition, kind of a definition for them I took. And it says, the things are people being spoken about who have already been mentioned. And here's what I want you to understand is all of us, whether we realize it or not, God speaks to us about people we're supposed to minister to who we're supposed to encourage, who we're supposed to share with, who we're supposed to serve. And sometimes we don't have the filter that we need in order to hear and see correctly. And the gospel is all about other people. God will take care of you, and our responsibility is now to look at the world and to serve and to give and to love, and that is what God expects of us. So number one, identify them. So when I talk about ministry, when I talk about serving, when I talk about giving, who comes up on your radar? Who pops into your head? Who do you think about? When when Jesus is talking about reconciling others, who do you think about? For me, I break things down into spheres or circles. So I have my family, I have my church family, uh, and then I have the world around me. I have the people at Walmart, and I have the, the, the people at, at the gym. And anytime I'm outside of the church, that's the sphere. And then I break it a little further into those who are Christians and those who aren't. Because whether or not, it doesn't matter to me, my job is to reconcile everybody back to God. So I deal with a lot of people who are broken, you know, who have had an aspect in their life, even if they're Christian, who've gone through something, my job is now to bring them to God for God to bring healing to them. Now, if they don't know Christ, that's different. I want them to know who Jesus is. I want them to know a loving Father. And so my approaches will be different, but it's to introduce them to who God is. So how many know that um, wherever we have influence, it's the result of proximity? So you are influencing somebody by your life, by the way you live. Work, home, the way you shop, the way you drive. Holy cow, I'm glad Pastor Raphael's not here. He's influencing a lot of people in Omaha. But your influence, um, your, your influence matters, and it's based on filters. How many know that we can bypass everybody, somebody every day because we don't have the right filter for them? Right? They're right in front of us, and we have not learned to recognize them. So how many are science nerds? All right, just a couple of you. So I love learning about the body. I love learning about the brain. Uh, I had some other stuff in here. I removed it. But today we're going to talk about the reticular activating system in your brain. All right? So here's what it is. It's a bundle of nerves at the base of your brain stem. And what it does, it actually... Um, helps you not pay attention to everything but to bring focus. So your brain takes in about 400 billion bits of information every second. And you're aware of about 2,000. Everybody say hallelujah. (laughs) Because if that kind of information was coming into your brain and you were aware of it, you would be on the floor uh, balled up in a ball. Right, So all of this information is coming in, and the reticular, reticular activating system actually weeds a lot of that stuff out. But I'm going to tell you how it operates. So have you ever been to a car lot, or maybe you've been looking at cars in our parking lot, and all of a sudden you see a car that you've never seen before? And you go, wow, I've never seen this car. And then you go out on the highway, or you're driving through the city, and you see them everywhere? That's what that does. It brings things into focus that all of a sudden your brain thinks you think that's important. And it brings it to your awareness. It creates a filter for you. And so part of our responsibility is to pay attention to the world around us so that we can pay attention to who God wants us to minister to or speak to or encourage. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And his will will always be in relation to them. Always. It's not just about you. It's about the people that are around you. So we have to redefine and pay attention to our filters. And if we don't have a filter for them, we won't minister to them. And if we don't see them, we won't serve them. So some of our filters may have excluded people. You know, there's a lot of people that the church won't deal with. We've actually either subconsciously or consciously said, well, I, I'm not going to reach out to them. But some of you guys, you have a filter that has said, well, I'm not good enough to do anything. Or I'm not knowledgeable enough to do anything. And so these filters actually help you see things, but they also help keeping you from actually doing maybe what you're supposed to do. So we'll talk just for a minute about some of the filters that I have. So I have a, a filter, and mine is everyone, everywhere, all the time. Doesn't matter where I am, doesn't matter what we're doing, whether in the church or outside the church, I want to help people. I want people to know who Jesus is. And so, you know, of course, my family, um, I want to minister to them. I want to talk to them about Jesus. I want to serve them. When I get here, I love being at church, but I'm a little odd. So um, I, I, I love to hug people, right? But I'm going to tell you why, because that's a little weird, you know? Uh, I, I, it started about 12 years ago, and the Lord said, go hug every usher, all right? Do you know why? Because they were mostly men, they were mostly older, and the Lord said, there's lots of people who don't know the Father's love, so go show them what that looks like. And here's the reaction that I would get almost every time. I'd hug them and they'd go. <laughs> almost every time. And so now, I, I know it's weird, but I will hug every person because I need them to have an idea that they're loved and they belong here. And so that's, that's one of the reasons. Another thing, I love to go to the back of the room. I don't like the front. I want to go to the back. So I go to the back, and I stand in the doors, and I look at people, which sounds really weird now that I say it like that. But I, what I'm looking for is God to highlight somebody. Because there have been times, I'm telling you, there was a, a person I saw over here, and he, was a, he, was a, he told me I was about to commit suicide, literally about to commit suicide. And God highlighted him, went over to him, talked to him, and every time he sees me now, he said, you know that, that I was about to commit suicide. And this, this was not somebody dealing with any mental illness or anything. He, he had made a decision. There was another person over here. I can remember God whispering to my heart, she's struggling with guilt. And I was like, okay. So uh, I talked to her, and she had had a child that had some, some health problems and some heart problems. And we were talking. And I told her what the Lord said, and eventually she came around and she said, do you know why I feel guilty? Because I feel like I did that to my child. And God loves us so much that he wants to bring us out of that. But if I don't have that filter and I just come in and I preach and I move on, I'm not actually doing what God's asking me to do. So I try to practice that filter. Um, then I look for leaders. I look for people who are not engaged. I look for people that have something that they're not utilizing something because I feel like all of us have an expression in the kingdom. And you actually help unlock other people when you use that. And I'm, I'm going to be honest, I'm pretty frustrated at times the way the church has operated because we've asked you to come in and sit, yet you're doing some incredible things outside of the church, in your jobs or in the community. I want to utilize that in here. And some people said, Amen. or not everybody, I don't expect everybody to believe it, but. So I think it's just people who are untapped. And so I want us to learn how as individuals to create filters, and then corporately as a church, we've got to create a filter as well. When we're in a community like this, there's needs that we're supposed to help steward. There's issues in our community that we're supposed to help take care of. Not one amen. Here's the thing. We're God's representatives on the earth. We have this limitless, powerful God. The church has become almost non-relevant to our communities. And so the question we have to ask, listen, if I asked our churches in our area, you know, what is good news to you? They would probably say, well, you guys pray well and you worship well and you're multicultural. 
But if I were to ask our community who don't know Jesus about good news, most of them would have no clue we exist. That's a problem. That's a problem. And so I look in the Bible and I look at, at the, the Daniels and I look at the Nehemiahs and I, I think about our marketplace community. And part of me, and, and I've been thinking about this for five years, I want to create a marketplace community in here where we raise up and teach people how to be Christians in the marketplace. That we actually help add value to their leadership skills, but also their spiritual skills in the marketplace. Where are the William Wilberforces that help end something, oppression? Where are the, the Frederick Douglasses and the Harriet Tubmans who are willing to go in and pull people out of something? Where are the, the Christine Canes who, because she was abused, mm, that she created an A21, and it's to pull people out of sex trafficking. Where are they? They're here. They're here. Where are the Barnabases, the people who will come alongside and go, I know you're raw, and I know people don't want to deal with you, but I will. See, there are needs in our community that we're called to steward because we have the best answer in Jesus. And here's the thing, I feel like for a long time we've, we've focused on getting people to church, now we need to focus on getting the church to the people. Okay. We'll see. Matthew 9.36 says this. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were help, harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He, he saw something. And he became their good shepherd. And we have to have a filter that shows us what's happening in our community. So how do you do that? How do you, how do you begin paying attention to maybe who you're, you're called to? Proximity is one, right? Because who you're near, that's part of your influence. So whether it be at your job or, in, of course, in your home or maybe even in here, but wherever you go, you have influence and proximity is one. What's on your radar? What, what makes you angry, what gets you frustrated, what upsets you, that's part of what God is showing you that he's inviting you in to, to bring change. What's your story? What has God healed you from? What has he restored you from? What have you come to know about him because of what you've been through? That's part of what you can give away as well. What do you have? Really practical. What are you good at? What skill, what ability, you're able to encourage, what do you have? And you can give that away. Understand that our role as Christians are both, it, it, it's spiritual and practical. Right. Sometimes I feel like we're so spiritual that we're of no earthly good. Yeah. And we, we need to be both spiritual and practical, okay? James 2, 14 and 19, I'm preaching better than the response I'm getting. We're going to keep going. <laughs> so James 2, 14 through 19, let's read this says, what good is it, dear brothers? And let me tell you, this is James. When you get to heaven, you may want to stay away from James. He may just punch you in your mouth just because. Even saved, he would get in your face. So what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say goodbye and have a good day. Stay warm and eat well but then you don't give that person any food or clothing, what good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Un unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Now someone may argue some people have faith, others have good deeds, but I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. You say you have faith for you believe that there is one God good for you, even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. So here's, here's what I want you to walk away with. It's not enough, church, to tell people about Jesus. We have to show them Jesus. We have to become the written word to the world around us. More and more, people don't care about a book they don't read and don't believe in. 
And so we have to be Jesus. We have to be that, that book to the world to show them what the gospel is really about and what Jesus is really about. So we have to have a filter to help identify the people that God is calling us to, both individually and corporately. Number two, we got to pray for them. Wow. Okay. Identify them to pray for them. We got to be willing to engage people in prayer. Because here's the thing. If you pray for people, you'll be drawn to people. The very people that you pray for, you'll draw near to. Your heart will turn. A lot of times prayer is not just about what God wants to do outside of you. It's about what he wants to do inside of you. And that's what prayer does. It brings change. Luke 18, 11 through 14. So for me, it's really important that we have an understanding of how we are to pray because the attitude of prayer needs to be right. Our heart attitude needs to be right. Will you put up Luke 18, 11 through 14? It says, the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I'm not, lo- not a sinner like everyone else. For I don't cheat, I don't sin, I don't commit adultery. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven, and he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh God, be merciful to me, for I'm a sinner. I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. I'm going to tell you what we look like to the world. Whether that's totally true, I'm not saying that it is. But a lot of times we come across like we're better than they are. And the reason why we're not is simply because of the grace of God. It is the grace of God. It is the forgiveness of God, the mercy of God that we we know about. And that's why we believe that anybody, if God got to you, certainly he can get to them out there. Right? And this is why we pray. It's because we want people to know about this goodness. This should be the most welcoming and the kindest and the warmest and the most expectant and faith-filled place on the earth because we know Jesus and we know what God can do. So I'm, I'm just putting, I put this in my notes. Quit trying to change their behavior and show them what Jesus looks like. It's always an inside-out job. You can get somebody to conform. doesn't mean their heart's changed. All right. It is good. Identity, right, or uh, helping people know who they are uh, is so important. But let's, um, let's go to verse or, uh, number three. Sorry. I'm getting sidetracked in, in my brain. So you got to identify them. you got to pray for them. And lastly, you got to serve them. Give your life away. Mother Teresa said this. Being unwanted, unloved, uncared for, forgotten by everybody, I think that is a much greater hunger, a much greater poverty than the person who has nothing to eat. Proximity is so important. Proximity is so important. And I need to be really honest with you, the church has to change. The church has to change. This is not, this is a mindset shift. Because I'm going to share just a couple of stories, and I'm going to show you some paradigms that I look at, and, and, and I, I literally is in my office repenting. According to Barna Research, 18% of millennials don't find Christianity relevant to their life. And our initial reaction is to go, yeah, but that's, that's you know, them, and that, that's culture. That's our fault. Because we're not showing them something that's relevant to their life. Relevance is not trying to be, you know, cool or whatever it is. It's about something that's needed, something that's accessible, life-changing. And if we're not presenting that, if we're not showing that, that's on us. I'm making a lot of people happy on Father's Day. Happy Father's Day, y'all. Um, we don't solve people. We don't solve people. We solve problems. We serve people. When we try to solve people, we remove remove their humanity. When cleaning up the mess becomes greater than working through the mess, you have a recipe for dysfunction. 
And I, I just, I'm convicted as God speaks these words that we've become really about wanting to, to, to make it look right rather than getting to the root and dealing with the mess. In 249 through 262 in Rome, there, uh, there's a plague, basically an, an epidemic that's going on. And it happened uh, in 150, and there is a bishop in Carthage named uh, Cyprian. And at that time, the church is uh, uh, still under Roman occupation. And they're mocked and, and uh, basically abused for what they believe in. And here are some of the things that the church was known for at that time. Christians were mocked for welcoming slaves. They cared for women and demanded fidelity from men to their wives. The church would raise funds to purchase the freedom of slaves. When Romans would leave unwanted children like in the fields, Christians would come and adopt them and take them in. When the plague hit, the doctors and the noblemen and, and the people of notoriety left. They would even leave their own families if they were sick. And it, it was the Christians who came alongside. And so as I, I started looking at the symptoms of, of what this was, and some people believe it was smallpox, um, Again, I'm a little bit of a science nerd, and I can remember reading the book Hot Zone, and Hot Zone is about the epidemiology of the beginning genesis of Ebola in Africa. And they were trying to tra figure out where it started from and what were the mechanisms and what were the hosts. And, and, um, and a lot of times what happens with Ebola, it, it burns itself out because it burns through its victims so quickly. It hosts, right? The, the organs will liquefy. Happy Father's Day, y'all. Sorry, I'm going into... <laughs> It's so terrible. Anyway, so the symptoms uh, of Rome at this time is, is um, of course, there would be vomiting and diarrhea, and then uh, the, the red, or the sclera, the white part of your eye would turn red, and then parts of the, the extremities would, um, would begin to get like sepsis, or it would uh, begin to, to die, and then they would fall off. And so these people were dying in the streets. And at one time, it was estimated that 5,000 people were dying a day, and the church was feeding about 3,000 people a day. And they were washing and caring for the sick. The reality is, is they probably were going to catch this. They were offering food and water, consoling the dying, and the Romans would marvel and say, look how they love one another. When's the last time they said that about the church? And this is what Cyprian said. This is in, in one of the books that he wrote. What a grandeur of spirit it is to struggle with all the powers of an unshaken mind against so many onsets of devastation and death. What sublimity to stand erect amid the desolation of the human race and not to lie prostrate with those who have no hope in God but rather to rejoice and to embrace the benefit of the occasion. To celebrate and embrace the benefit of the occasion. That in thus bravely showing forth our faith and by suffering endured, going forward to Christ by the narrow way. Let me bring you an updated story. Rick Warren, and I, this so impacted me a while ago, um, that I, I looked that story up again, and Rick Warren tells the story of his wife. And his wife uh, had heard that there were nine million orphans worldwide, maybe more now, uh, due to the AIDS epidemic. And she just was struck by that number. You know, the church is supposed to be the place that, that cares for the orphan. And so when she saw that number, she couldn't get it out of her head, and, and Rick was like, you know, just you know, put, your, put your time or interest into something else, and, and God just wouldn't let it go inside of her. So she says, we got to do something about this, and we need to use our church resources to do something about this. You know, Saddleback Church has uh, worldwide reach, and so finally Rick said, okay, let, let's do something. Well, Almost immediately after that, she gets diagnosed with breast cancer. And so almost everything stops just to, to get her to treatments and things like that. And there was a, this point in time where she, uh, her hair begins to fall out. And she says, well, I don't want my hair just to fall out you know, over time. So they invite uh, a hairstylist to come in and they begin to shave her head. And as it's happening, 
uh, her son is going, oh, mom, you're so beautiful. And she gets up and she goes in to look in the mirror and she basically, she's dying. And she's emaciated and hair's gone. And she goes and she lays her head in her husband's lap. And, and he just keeps rubbing her head going, oh, my beautiful Kay. Oh, my beautiful Kay. And she kept going, God, why did this happen? What purpose can this serve? And so eventually she recovers and she's in remission and she begins to travel the world talking about the AIDS epidemic and, and meeting with uh, survivors and meeting with families. And she comes across this lady in Cambodia and the lady just you know, pours her heart out because her husband had died. And so she gets back to the States and she says, we're doing this all over the world, but what about in America? And so she contacts an organization in Orange, Orange County and um, she, she meets with the guy and, the, and, and she says, you know, I'm, I'm part of a church. And he says, we don't need you. We don't want you. And she, she says, no, I mean, we, we have groups of people that are wanting to come and, and, and serve. And he says, no, nah, we don't want you. And she said, no, we, we won't come in and preach a sermon. And he's like, I honestly believe what you're saying, but I don't know what your church believes. And so she started thinking, she was sitting there, and she started thinking about the time that she looked in the mirror, and she was gaunt, and she was emaciated. And she said, I know what it's like to, to feel like I'm dying or, or to be dying. And she said, the people who served alongside me helped me that I was not afraid of death. And the man reached over his hand and said, I'm not afraid to die either. I just don't want to die alone. And the church is supposed to be the people who come alongside society to show them that there's hope. And so, of course, they had five uh, teams that then they just began to do koinonia. Started picking them up, taking them to appointments, doing life with them, not demanding that they change, but showing them the gospel. And the question that I have to ask is, are we living biblical Christianity? I put in my notes, Jesus is not inviting us into moderation. Are we actually living biblical Christianity to them? Jesus offends my reasonable Christian sensibilities. I find myself qualifying statements such, a, such as to alleviate myself for the fear that maybe he really meant what he was saying to love others. Identify them, pray for them, and serve them. We are ambassadors of reconciliation. So I'm, I, th this, is, this is more to put this on your mind. That as a church, we have to think differently, we have to serve differently, we have to see people differently because we are agents of reconciliation to show them what God is like. And right now, the church is not seen as an agent of reconciliation, they're seen as other things. Fathers, I'm gonna ask that you stand again. I'm gonna challenge you. Because you set the tone for your house, you set the tone for your family. In many ways, you set the tone for our church. I am so grateful for you as men. And I'm, so many times I failed. I have not done my part. I have not done what I was supposed to. I felt lost at times. But we set the tone for our homes and our family and the people around us. I'm challenging you, get your hands dirty. Don't let mom just do it. Get your hands dirty. Help lead your family, lead your kids, lead this church. Apologize if you have made mistakes. Tell people I've blown it missed it. Say the words, I love you. And if it's hard for you to do, do that, write the words, I love you. But make sure that you tell somebody, your kids, your family, the people around you, that you love them. Ask God to meet you in the places of your brokenness, because we're all broken in different ways. Make it a point to meet other godly men and allow them access into your life to help you become the man that God designed and to become an ambassador of reconciliation in your home and with your family. 
Church, could we do something right now? Could we lay our hands on the men and bless them and pray for them right now? So if you guys would stand up, go to uh, one of the men and just begin to pray for them. I'm going to lead you in prayer. Father, we thank you for these men. We thank you, God, for the incredible opportunity to lead, to raise a, a family, and, and to be, for some spiritual dads, to people maybe who have never seen what it looks like to have a father. I pray, God, grace upon their life. I pray empowerment upon them, God. I pray that, God, they would be able to roll off the shame and roll off uh, their mistakes, God, that they would receive from you, God, what it means to receive love and forgiveness and grace and mercy. And God, may they give that away at every opportunity, God. I'm so grateful for their lives, God, and I pray that, God, they wouldn't give up in the struggle. They wouldn't stop doing what is right. They would stand in the midst of a wicked culture, God, to stand for biblical principles, to stand for you, God, and to keep pressing and to keep fighting and to keep giving and to keep serving and to keep praying. May your grace rest upon them, God, for they don't know that their lives are transforming a generation of people. We bless them and we're for them. God, may you come alongside them and may you reveal yourself in a powerful way this week. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Could you put, put your hands together for our men? Today's message is not a rebuke. It's just saying there's need everywhere. We've got to have the filters. We have this incredible God that loves people. We've got to be willing to go out and to serve and to give and to show that to them. So I'm asking that you'll pray, God, show me the people around me that you're calling me to, to serve, to give, and to love, and to create that new filter. And then as a church, there's needs right around this church that we're not aware of. There's needs in our city that God is inviting us to help be a solution to the problem. All right, let me pray over you. Father, I pray that you would continue to speak to us. Pray, God, that you would give us filters, God, to see, and that those people come up on our radar, God, those problems in our community come up on the radar, God, because you have the answers. And the church is the, the hope of the world. Pray, God, that uh, you would go with us as we leave today. We love you, and we're so grateful. God, help good news. Help us as individuals be agents of reconciliation. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Our altars are open if you want to receive prayer or if you need to give your heart to the Lord. Be glad to lead you in that. God bless you. Take care of your, your fathers today.